The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. What is blood? Well... That all depends. To some, blood is a cause for pride. To others, blood is a reason for prejudice. Blood. Mysterious blood. It unites us. It divides us. Ironic, isn't it? When you consider that everyone's blood is the same. Well, practically... mystery drama, The Only Blood, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Howard Da Silva. They came by the millions to America. They came wearing a rainbow of costumes and speaking a babble of tongues. Frightened by the strangeness of marvelous, mysterious America, they huddle together for security in clusters of kinfolk, landslide goombas, to begin the often slow and sometimes painful process of becoming Americans. And this is the story of one of them, a man named Anthony Boda. And it happened some 40 years ago in a large East Coast city. You're not hungry tonight, Anthony. Oh, yes, I, I'm really very hungry. You haven't eaten a bite. I... I was thinking. Oh, uh, about what? Well, I, I'm not sure. Ah, uh, look, you always tell me later. Well, this time, tell me sooner. I... Ten dollars is missing. Ten dollars? Yes. How is that possible? Well, you know, thanks to Lewis, we now have a cash register in the store. I was always opposed to it. Well, the boy is right. It's the modern way. It's how things are done in America. But when you kept the money in a drawer, nothing was ever... When missed. we kept the money in a drawer, we never knew. How could we tell? This way, every time you take in money, it prints on a paper. At the end of the day, the paper tells you how much money you should have. Oh, well, then perhaps... Perhaps what? Perhaps the paper is wrong. Impossible. No, what troubles me is it's always $10. What do you mean, always? Well, not only is it always $10, but it's always missing on a Friday night. I tell you, it's that machine. Oh, for the last six weeks. Could it be that Lewis... Oh, no. Your own son? Your only son? I don't know what to think. Throw out that machine. Go have your lunch, Lewis. Oh, I promised the lady she could have her shoes at one o'clock. No, no, I'll finish for you. Go. Mama doesn't like it when anybody's late to eat. Hello, Louis. Uh, what, what, what can I do for you, Chuck? You got to hand over a fin. Uh, listen, listen, could we talk about this later? What? Later? I'm here now. Get it up. Lewis, who is this man? What does he want? You, uh, Pop, it, it's no just a little... No reason why you shouldn't introduce me to your old man. The association likes to know all its customers. What association is this, Lewis? Pop, I can explain everything later. I, I saw you last night, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, I know. But the executive board held a meeting this morning. You know how prices are going up everywhere. Like, for instance, what are you paying for leather today? You see what I mean? So, with, uh, what, with your overhead and everything, we got to go from 10 to 15. But I don't have the... No way. I want to be your pal. But you know how it is. All right. Here you are. Lewis, what are you doing? Papa, please. He's smiling, Pop. Everybody smiles today. Look at this fiver here. Even Lincoln's smiling. Shows you've done a good thing. 
See you next week. Same time, same station. So, this is what happens to the ten dollars. I was hoping you wouldn't find out. You were hoping what? That maybe I can't add, count? I used to pay for my own pocket, but lately I... I... So, we belong to the association. For what reason? Because we have to. We have to? Everybody belongs. Every shop in the street. My son, it is quite possible that you have forgotten who you are. Let me remind you. You are not a sheep who follows. You are a man who leads. Poppy, you don't understand. I understand quite well. We had these bandits in the old country, too. When several rode up to our farm, my father shot them. No, Poppy, you don't understand. I understand this, my son. I didn't come to this country to live on my knees. Tony. Good afternoon, Vincent. Well, I can see. Here is a man who carries the troubles of the entire world on his shoulders. You learn something every day. What did you learn today? I learned that men who appear to be strong, proud, and honest are afraid to join their hands together. I will also turn you down. Vincent... These are not just street hoodlums, Anthony. They work for a powerful man. An important man. A bandit chief. Perhaps. But here he is respected. He stands well with the politicians. His name is Al Carley. But how... Anthony! Certain things are the same in every country. But there is a principle. Oh, yes. At first, I too felt bad to bathe these dogs for protection. And then there were fights. People were afraid to come in. But it's wrong. I see it as just another tax. But this time, I get what I pay for. You mean you will not fight these swine? Come, Anthony, what is it? A few dollars? It won't make you, it won't break you. I see. I will fight him alone. Anthony. I must say the chicken is the finest you ever made. I wanted this to be the best supper in your life. Is that true? Why? Because it could very well be your last supper. Oh, and what does that mean? Lewis has been talking to me about the association... And what right does our Lewis have to worry his mother with business matters? Since when is a woman to be concerned? Lewis with... is frightened. Why? Anthony, there is no way in the world you can defy these thieves. This is America. Here one does not have to fear. There is a man named Al Carley. He is what is known as a boss. He is not my boss. I could never look at myself in the mirror if I bowed down to scum like that. You will pay these people. Maria, are you telling me how to run my business? You will pay these people. Never. Promise. I'll think about it. Promise. Very well, I promise. Papa? What is it? I, I, uh, I don't think you should be here. No. No, 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 Papa, because... Yes? Because? He'll be here any minute, and, and well... And you would rather I did not witness the shameful transaction that will take place, huh? You don't have to be involved with it. You mean I should pretend this thing does not exist, huh? Okay, Papa, okay. It's just that you've got a short fuse, and I'm afraid one word could lead to another, and, well... I must see this with my own eyes. Besides, it's already too late. The jackal is at the door. Well, happy... Days to Anthony Boda and son, as the sign reads on the window. I will pay the money, Lewis. Well, this is a gloomy-looking group. What's the matter? No hello? No how are you? No house tricks? Where's all this old-world courtesy I used to hear about? Now take your money and get out. What's eating you, Pop? I don't like to be called Pop by a common thug. Listen, Pop. Maybe I'd better smarten you up. Chuck, he, he doesn't mean now, it. Now, you don't mean it, do you? I never spoke a word I didn't mean. Well, then, that calls for this. <laughs> I only want to teach you manners, Pop. Now, do you apologize? Or do I knock out your teeth? Louie, 
Explain to your father what the score is. Papa, please. Lewis, explain why you stand by while this animal strikes your father. <laughs> what could he do about it? He could do this. Oh. And this. No, Papa, Papa, don't, don't hit him again. I'll kill you. Papa, he has a gun. Oh, I see, I see. Drop it. Drop it. Drop the gun. I'll break your arm. Yeah. Oh. I said to let go of the gun. Well, what are we going to do now, Papa? Summon a taxi cab. We will deposit this, this refuse, this human garbage at the police station. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Boda, I'd like to talk to you in private, okay? About what, officer? Well, that's why we better talk in private. Now, this way, huh? Uh, sit down, please, Mr. Bona. Thank you. I'm Sergeant Carey. Each and every word I'm about to say to you is off the record. If you ever quote me, I'll swear I never said it. Understand? What is there to understand? Here's the situation. I'm on duty at the desk. You come in with this badly beat-up hoodlum. Ah, uh, you know he's a hoodlum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got a small reputation. But that's all I know. And you say you want to press charges. By all means. We only have your word that he tried to shake you down. And the word of my son and all the shopkeepers in the neighborhood. We can have this... Suppose animal. all the neighbors dummy up. Suppose they don't want to get involved. You... An officer of the police? Are you telling me I must submit to this? No, no. I'm just trying to give an honest man the same break we give a criminal. When a crook is brought in, we inform him of his rights. But I still don't see why. I must listen. Al Carly is your enemy. Not that small-time hood. Al Carly's got judges, politicians, businessmen in his hip pocket. And policemen, too? I wouldn't doubt it. Then it's time that pocket was slashed open. And those vermin were exposed to the light of day. If you bring charges, you'll have the best lawyers money can buy. Sergeant, thank you for your kindness, but we're wasting time. Okay. Do this. You say the man you brought in is the collection guy for the neighborhood? Yes. Call some of your friends. See if they'll come down and identify him. See if they'll sign affidavits. Of course they will. All it required was one man to lead the way. How can they refuse me now? Do what is required, Sergeant. Place this... this animal behind bars. There is no doubt that Anthony Boda is a man of strong courage and firm convictions. But he may be just a little bit unaware of the qualifications for leadership. We will consider leaders and followers when I return shortly with Act Two. When a hoodlum tried to shake down Anthony Boda, an immigrant shoemaker, Anthony who believes what he has read about law and justice, promptly disarmed the thug and delivered him to the police station. Sergeant Carey, a wise, cynical, and experienced officer, is trying to explain to Anthony that things are not really the way they seem. Mr. Boda, listen. Al Carly doesn't want rough stuff for publicity if he can help it. He'll yank Chuck out of there and stick him someplace else if you'll forget the whole thing. He told you all this? I don't want you to get hurt. You are a man with heart, Sergeant. But it is more important for me to discover something. Discover what? If I made the right choice when I decided to come to America. Yes? You had me, brother? Who are you? I can be your best friend or your worst enemy. Mister, I like riddles, but not in the middle of a working day. What's your business here? And my name is Carly, Al Carly. You heard about me? 
I heard. I cannot say I like what I heard. But I like what I heard about you. Yes? What have you heard about me? Hey, tell me you're a man. And? And so you should be concerned with that little situation that happened here the other day. Why? Because it's beneath you. I will not be slapped by hoodlums. Of course not. You gave better than you got. Your honor should be satisfied. Now forget it. This matter is now in the hands of the law. Of course. But in whose hands is the law? In the hands of a man who can buy better lawyers, better witnesses. I'm not sure I understand what you want. In this case against my collector, well, he is scum, isn't he? Well, this case must not go to trial. Why not? You have the lawyers, the witnesses, the judges, the juries. What have you got to fear? I have read the Bible. A pity you don't take it seriously. Back then, when the fight was arranged, who could have believed that David would kill Goliath, huh? Drop the charges. No. Anthony, I want to get away from this rough stuff. I got a kid, she's going to college. American society girls go to that college. This daughter of yours, she knows, of course, what her father does. It really does. I see. Anthony, I need a guy like you. To do what? What, to help me run my organization? Uh, you don't want me. Ah, plenty of guys got guts, Anthony, and plenty of guys got brains. But you're one of very few guys who got both. Why are you killing yourself in a shoe repair store, huh? You don't want me, Mr. Carley. If I ever decide to become what you are, there wouldn't be room for us both in the same organization. Do you understand me? I came here because I like to avoid bloodshed. You're a chump. You'll never know what hit you. Vincent, were the police here to see you, Vincent? Well? Yes. Someone from the... from the district attorney. I received another visitor, too. Who? This gentleman explained uh, certain facts. Facts? Yes. This gentleman explained that in order to run my business here, I need a license. You always knew that, Vince. Yes. But he explained that when I apply to renew my license, there might be difficulties. You get your license from the government, not from these hoodlums. Uh, but you see, this gentleman is with the government. That part of the government that sees to these things. I don't believe it. I spoke with the lawyers in the district attorney's office. I believe them to be honest and sincere men. They said they would protect me. They will protect you, too. Calm, Vincent. Talk to them. I'll think about it. What's there to think about? Uh, Tony, things are not so simple. I see. You have already thought about it, and you have decided. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Bonham. Ah, uh, the police sergeant. Now that you're going through with it, we'll protect you as much as we can. Thank you. No, we should thank you. You're doing something no one has done before. You're a man of courage. What chance do, I, do we have? It'd be better if we could have more witnesses, but maybe they'll come around. Uh, the newspapers have caught hold of it. I brought you a copy. Here, see what it says. Shoemaker defies mob. This is about me. Mm -hmm. That man who spoke to me in the police station, he was a reporter. That's right. Well, uh, we have won. No. We have to win in court. But the newspapers say well, the we... The papers, you're today's sensation. Tomorrow, it'll be somebody else. Don't go anywhere without telling us. And we'll have a man watching the store day and night. Hello? Yeah, where you been? Well, how come I couldn't reach you all morning yet? Yeah? Well, what have you been doing? You're supposed to keep it out of the papers. It's all on the front pages. It... 
Listen, this case can't go to trial, you understand? Well, you figure it out. That's what you got paid for. Clowns. I'm surrounded by clowns. Oh, Danny. Marissa, what are you... I mean, uh, should you be in school? Yes. Something the matter? Daddy, I, I even have a midterm exam. When? At two o'clock. Well, that's four hours from now. I'll drive you back up there myself, no, huh? No, I, I have my car. Marissa. Look, there are stories in the papers, and, and my friend said to me, oh, of course, it isn't your dad. And I said, of course not. It's another Al Carly. And, well, the reason that... The reason I came down here... Was to ask me... Oh, Daddy, I, I didn't know what to think. It is another Al Carly. Daddy, oh, would... I knew it, I knew it. Oh, Daddy, can, can you ever forgive me? Uh, what's to forgive? Uh, high school. Oh, look, Daddy, would you mind terribly if I, if I change my major... I've decided, finally. It's sociology. I want to work with poor children. Okay, you go right ahead, baby. You do whatever you want. Oh, well, um, you know, some of us are thinking of renting a store or something downtown and helping kids study the core subject. Hey, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll pay the rent and buy a book. <laughs> Daddy, I... I don't know what could have possibly gotten into me. I, how could I have even thought... Forget it, Marissa, baby. Forget it. Oh, what I forgot was what I should always remember. It's in the Bible you bought me. Honor thy father. Hey, you better get back to school. See, Lewis. See what it says in the newspapers. Papa, I just wish I were like you. Uh, you're my own son. You're just like me. No, no, Papa. Very few people are just like you. You were, you were born at the wrong time. What? How can a man be born at the wrong time? No, no. You should have been born when there were great kings and heroes and fighters. My son, every age needs fighters. I know I failed you, Papa. But I'm, I'm frightened. <sighs> There's nothing to be frightened of. Yes, Papa, there is. What? Everything... But I'll stand by you, Papa. I know you will. Mama. Maria, what do you have there? A package. The, the letterman brought it to the house. What kind of package? Oh, it's here. Let's see. It says, uh, from the letter company. Why would the letter company send a package to the house? Here, let me see. Mm. Yes. It's from the letter company. It's their label. Must be those special strips I wanted. Papa? What is it, Louis? That package. What about the package? Uh, I, I I don't know. It uh, must be my imagination. <laughs> Listen, Lewis, your trouble is you live too much in your imagination. Open up the package. All right. Well, I'll go shopping. Uh, what would you like for supper? Why do you ask? <laughs> You're now a famous man. <laughs> Papa, this doesn't look like... Like what? Like the leather company package. Look out, it's a bomb. <laughs> Just a moment ago, the shoe repair shop of Anthony Boda and Son was a neat, bright, cheerful establishment. A mother, a father, a son. A close-knit, loving family stood together, talking, laughing. Now the place has become a mass of twisted, smoking wreckage. And three bodies lie motionless in the ruin. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Anthony Boda was a boy in the darkness of the old country. America was a shining beacon light in the distance. Years later, with hard work and some good luck, he was able to come to America with his wife and his son. And because he believed in justice, he defied the gangsters who were trying to extort protection money. And it happened that soon after, a bomb destroyed his tiny shoe repair shop. And the beacon light that was once America for Anthony Boda is flickering faintly. 
and about to die. Uh, Mr. Boda, they say you should be out of here in a couple of days. Yes. All of us, we... We're very sorry. Thank you, Sergeant. I know that nothing can bring back your wife and your son. Tell me, Sergeant. Why were they killed at once while I received only scratches? But it uh, has to do with uh, the angle of forces, I suppose. No, 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 no. I mean, what reason? What plan? Why had the Lord seen fit... For that, you would have to ask a priest. I have asked the priest. And? And he said God's ways follow a mysterious design. So you see, I am no wiser than before. I'm sorry about the other thing, too. What other thing? The trial. Oh, the trial. I should say that there was no trial. It doesn't matter. The hood just disappeared. So there was no defendant. Carly must have had him taken for a ride. It doesn't matter. Oh, yes, it does. You set an example for us. You woke a lot of people up. We're after Carly now. It doesn't matter. You can't keep saying it doesn't matter. I have succeeded in unraveling the riddle myself. You see, I had become arrogant. I had forgotten the law of nature. The strong destroy the weak. I had seen my pictures in the newspapers. My head was turned as if I were drunk on champagne. I didn't listen to men of experience and true wisdom. Men like my friend Vincent. Pay it. It's just another tax. I have been punished. You can't talk that way. Believe me, Mr. Boda, we'll break up that mob. That will be your affair. Carly figures he can ride out this particular storm just like he rode out others, but he won't. Of course not. I intend to kill him. You can't make your own justice, Mr. Boda. But I must. That's the only justice there is. <laughs> I didn't think you would ever speak to me again, Anthony. We've been friends too long, Vincent. Mm. I forgot that. I should have agreed to be a witness. Not because it was right or wrong. But because a friend asked me. Maria and Louis. I'm so sorry, Tony. They must be avenged. What are you saying? I must kill this animal. Kill him personally. This Al Carly. Tony... Only this kind of thing, it's not done in America. I'm sick and tired of being told what is and what is not done in America. I don't want you to get into trouble, Tony. I come to you as a friend. Will you help me? Well... The answer is yes or the answer is no. The answer is not well. The answer is yes. The hunting rifle, the one your father made. Tony... There's no better, no more accurate weapon in all the world. But what can you... It gives me two barrels, the over and the under. I need only two shots. One for Mr. Carley, the other for his bodyguard. Well, you can't walk around the streets with a rifle. No, there is no way to get him here in the city. But I have learned something. On a Friday night, he slips away. He takes the turnpike north. He drives alone, except for this bodyguard. Tony... There is a place... Where the road is being fixed. So one must slow down. That's where I will be in ambush. Well, the rifle. Can I talk you out of this, Tony? No. I knew that. Well, when do we go there? We. What is a friend, Tony? A friend is another gun to stand beside you. And not much traffic. Are you sure he comes here this late at night? Yes, yes. And is that... No, no. See? See how the car must practically crawl past because of the construction? 
This barricade gives us perfect hiding place. I put blacking on the gun barrel so it wouldn't shine in the moonlight. Thank you, Vincent. I have a score to settle with him, too, you know. Well, not as great as mine. No. That's why you may have the first two shots. After that... Listen. Is that... Yes. You're sure? Yes. I can even make out his evil face in the moonlight. Let him come just a little closer. I've got him. I've got him. Now. How could we miss? We didn't miss. He's gone. He's got away. Cody! Didn't you see? The shell simply bounced off. His car has a coat of armor. The glass is bulletproof. There's no way we can shoot him. There's just no way. Hello, Mr. Boda. Good evening, Sergeant Curry. I figured I'd find you here in Vincent's. You are looking for me? Mm Mm-hmm. I hear you and Vincent went hunting last night. Hunting? Yeah. You did some shooting up around South Chester. I don't know where you receive your information, Sergeant. That's not the right way. By now, you should know you can't gun him down. After last night, he'll build up more protection than ever. That's true. There is no way I can get to him. I'm glad you realize that before you get into a lot of trouble. But there is a way I can make him come to me. What are you saying? Yes. I can make him come to me himself. With blood in his eye. Burning with hatred. Obsessed with the desire to murder me with his own hand. Mr. Boda. And then, of you... course, I will have every right to kill him. Because, you see, I will be compelled to kill him in self-defense. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. Well, I'm afraid school's over for the night. I'm just closing up. Uh, you have a child you want us to tutor? No. Oh, well then, uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Um... Boda. Anthony Boda. Is the name familiar? Well, I... I don't know. I, I seem to remember seeing it somewhere, but I can't recall. Uh, what do you want, Mr. Boda? Your father, among a thousand other crimes, killed my wife and son. What? What are you saying? You know what I'm saying. But you... You must be mad. I'll I'll call the police. You'll call the police. But why? I've done nothing wrong. I have merely stated a fact. Look, you... you Get out of here. Will that change the fact? My father, he's... He's good. He's kind. He's... He's the most decent man in the world. How does your father earn his money? Where is his factory? What goods does he handle? In what does he trade? I'm a shoemaker. I smell of leather. Your father, he smells of death because his business is death. I I don't know what you're talking. Were you about to say you don't know, you don't wish to know? You read, you think? Get out of here. Get out, get out! Good evening, Miss Carley. Dad, you remember I I asked you about the man in the papers? You said it was another Al Carly. Marissa, what are you trying to... Don't lie to me, Daddy. Don't lie to me. Yeah, but... But it was another Al Carly. Don't lie to me, please. Uh... It's bad enough I... I had to lie to myself. It was another Al Carly. Now listen, please, listen. There are two Al Carlys. One is your dad. The other is somebody who does what he has to do. The only thing he knows how to do. Oh, I never saw it before. I suppose I never wanted to see it, but... A man named Anthony Boda, just a shoemaker, opened my eyes. And I can never close them again. Boda? Did you say Boda? Anthony Boda. 
I have never seen such dignity. I was a fool. I should have made sure of him before. But I'll kill him with my own two hands. <laughs> I'll cut his heart out. Benji, can't you get more speed out of this heap? Come on, faster! It's a state trooper. Lose him. Look out, look out! That idiot up ahead is turning. He's, he's, look out! Mr. Boda. Yes. Ah, the sergeant. I've been looking for you. Hop in. You heard the news? I heard the news. He was coming after you. I knew he would. But I have been robbed. I will not have my revenge. He's dead. Uh, no. The radio said he cannot live. So you see, there is no justice for me. And do you know why he can't live? He needs blood. He can buy all the blood he needs. No, he can't. Why not? Because he, uh... It so happens he has a very rare type of blood. And he needs a transfusion from someone who has that same type. Only someone with that same blood can save him. Surprising. I thought his blood would be as base and as common as sewage. We do know of a donor. The hospital has a record of someone with the exact same blood type. Why tell me? Because you are the blood type. Ah, I me? I have the same blood as that swine? Yes, Mr. Bonham. The only person we know of. How is this fact made known? Well, when you and your wife and son were brought to the hospital, naturally your blood was typed. One of the lab technicians happened to remember. Well, that's the blood Carly needs. Or he'll die before tonight. You... You expect me to give my blood to the murderer of my wife and my son? You expect me to keep this animal alive? Mr. Boda. How, how I prayed that I would kill this monster. I thought my prayers would never be answered, but they were. They were. I now hold his life in my hands. So you see, Sergeant, this is justice. No, that's not justice. It's revenge. Let the law deal with him. You may drive me to the hospital, but he'll never see one drop of my blood. And why do you want to go to the hospital? To look in his eye. To laugh in his face. To let him know who has conquered. Carly. Al Carly, can you hear me? Yes. Do you know who I am? Yes. Do you know why I'm here? To torture me. I was in this hospital. You killed my wife, my son. I swore I would kill you with my own hands. Mr. Boda, please, please, don't let me die. What? What? What do you say? Please. You beg me, your enemy, your sworn enemy, for your life. Please, please, I. Let me live. This? This is what makes us tremble? This is who owns judges, lawyers, politicians? This is what we fear? You cowardly animal. Can't you even die decently? Mr. Boda. Mr. Boda, you came. I knew you would come. You see, Daddy, I told you. Mr. Boda is a man... Does the doctor know? Have they been told to prepare for the transfusion? The transfusion? That's that's why you came, isn't it? To, to give Daddy the blood? Daddy says you would never do it. 
Daddy said you would drain every drop of blood from your own body and die first before you... Shh, shh, shh. The young girl should not talk like that in front of her father. Now, now you must say no more. Carly. Al Carly, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes, I... Uh... Al Carly, you are very close to eternity. Speak the truth. For the very first time in your life, the truth. Look into my eyes, Al Carly, and tell me. Tell me. If it were the other way and I lay dying, would you give me your blood? Answer. And remember, God is listening. The truth, Al Carly. Would you give me your blood? Would you? No. Daddy. This is between your father and me. You would not give me your blood, Al Carly? No. No. Then this is the difference between us. I will give you mine. Al Carly recovered. He stood trial. His empire collapsed like a towering castle of sand when the high tide sweeps up on the beach. Al Carly will not be around for a while. Ninety-nine years, to be exact. But when his daughter needs advice and comfort, she visits with Anthony Boda. They're good for each other. Each makes up for something the other has lost. I'll be back shortly. Anthony Bodas, the Al Carleys, each brought the same blood to the melting pot of America. But the melting pot is a crucible where men, like steel, may either be hardened or destroyed. Our cast included Howard Da Silva, Ken Harvey, Robert Dryden, Bryna Rayburn, and Jack Grimes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Listen to Mystery Theater again tomorrow night. Same time, same station. Now stay tuned for the news next. CBS News. The White House floats a trial balloon, indicating its willingness to bypass impeachment debate in the House and go direct to a Senate trial. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. Presidential speechwriter Patrick Buchanan indicated possible White House willingness for the House to approve impeachment without a roll call or floor debate. Such a move would assure a quicker trial in the Senate. Some House members on both sides of the aisle were cool toward the idea. Democrat John Bradamus of Indiana called it an act of desperation by the White House. Republican Charles Wiggins of California said it would be repugnant to him if the House fails to give full and deliberate consideration to an issue as momentous as impeachment. Senator Barry Goldwater Wednesday offered another suggestion that President Nixon go before both houses of Congress and answer questions about impeachment. Goldwater also expressed the belief that the lawmakers will, for the most part, vote their consciences. I feel that this is probably going to be the most honest vote that's ever been taken in either house. I doubt that you can find five people in the Senate who will vote either way because of uh, political reasons. I know that uh, those that I know well, including myself, are going to wait till we've heard all the evidence... And then we're going to vote the way that we feel it should go. Senator Barry Goldwater. The U.N. Security Council had another meeting Wednesday night to talk about Cyprus from the U.N. Richard C. Hotlet reports.
The UN effort to enforce the ceasefire in Cyprus and help move things back to normal there has received two bitter blows. The Soviet Union vetoed a draft resolution which would have given UNFISIP, the UN Peace Force on Cyprus, the authority to police security zones to be set up between the Turkish Army and the Cyprus National Guard. Ambassador Yakov Malik, who came to the council chamber directly from the airport, returning from Moscow, explained that he cast his veto for procedural reasons. He accused Britain of trying to ram a resolution through, even though the Soviet delegation had no instructions. This means a delay of 24 hours at least before proper orders can go out to the UN force. The second blow was a message from the Turkish military commander on Cyprus asking for immediate withdrawal of UN personnel from the area under Turkish control. The ambassador of Greece at once raised the question whether this territory was now to stop being part of Cyprus. The council then adjourned, tense and glum. It will be up to Malik, who assumes the presidency for August, to convene it again. Richard C. Hottle at CBS News, United Nations. Senator Lloyd Benson, Democrat of Texas, said Wednesday night that President Nixon's economic policies offer only high interest rates, tight money, and slow economic growth. Benson said action should be taken to channel loan money into the most productive industries, including housing, and urged President Nixon to establish a task force to keep track of price increases and wage settlements. Benson spoke on a nationwide broadcast on behalf of the Democratic congressional leadership. The speech was a response to President Nixon's address on the economy last week. It was another day and evening of tension at the Texas State Penitentiary. There were more threats by Fred Carrasco, ringleader of three inmates, threatening to kill their 13 hostages if their demands for freedom are not met. The hostages have been held for eight days. Now this. Time Magazine. What's in it for you this week? Cover story. The four days behind the fateful 2711 vote to impeach the president. Time shows you how private decisions were made. How differences were reconciled. How struggles over specificity were resolved. How each member of the House Judiciary Committee endured his own anguish of responsibility. In the Nation, a report on the rationale behind the Supreme Court's unanimous no to Mr. Nixon. The World, a study of the uneasy ceasefire in Cyprus. The tough talk of the Turks. The sudden retreat of the Greek generals. And the return of Constantine Karamanlis to power. In Athens. These are some of the 46 news stories in the current issue of Time. Reports that help you view the whole world's week. For Time takes you to Switzerland to witness the new vigor of evangelical Protestantism. To Russia, where there's no inflation. Only an Orwellian ripoff that does the same thing. To Australia, to trace an invasion of toads that weigh three pounds, live 40 years, and eat almost anything. And to Vatican City for a look at the problems of putting together a collection of 20th century religious art. It's all in Time this week. Pick up a copy today. For Time makes everything more interesting, including you. Yule Gibbons, the well-known natural foods advocate, has an ulcer, according to his doctor. One might wonder, has the 63-year-old Gibbons been eating too many dandelion greens or wild hickory nuts? Negative, says his doctor. He says Gibbons had been taking too many aspirin for an arthritic condition, and the aspirin caused the ulcer. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. CBS News. President Nixon is reportedly considering changing his strategy on impeachment dramatically. And Vice President Ford is now taking a different approach. I'm Jim Kilpatrick reporting on the CBS radio network. Mr. Nixon spent most of Wednesday in what are described privately as high-level strategy sessions. Several options are believed to be under consideration. An appearance before the full House of Representatives offering to answer questions as one possible way of breaking the impeachment momentum. Or the White House urging the House to pass on impeachment without floor debate or a roll call. Vice President Ford has repeatedly defended Mr. Nixon in the impeachment case. Just last week, but before the Judiciary Committee vote on Saturday, the Vice President took a tough stand. First, Ford's comment, then a report by Phil Jones. Not all, but a substantial amount of the effort against the President is an attempt and an effort to try and undo the election results of 1972, and don't you forget it. Muncie, Indiana, last Thursday. It was Ford's strongest defense of the president to date. Since then, the vice presidential travels have continued, but the tone of his defense of President Nixon has mellowed. 
in San Francisco, San Diego, Las Vegas, Reno, this week, the vice president at times not even mentioning the president's impeachment problems. He is disturbed by the increased impeachment questions, and some of his closest political advisors, who now feel he'll be president soon, think he should end his constant defense of the president. The question is how best to jump the president's ship. The strategy appears to be, if the president is impeached by the House, Ford will say it is time for him to shut up. Bill Jones, CBS News, with the vice president in Sutton, Massachusetts. Officials at the Texas State Prison in Huntsville and the armed convicts are right back where they were this time last night, considering new demands. David Henderson reports. It was a day filled with high-level tension and sometimes confusing demands from the three armed convicts who are holding 13 hostages inside the Huntsville, Texas State Prison. Twice, the rebel inmates, led by Fred Carrasco, threatened to blow up several of their hostages with homemade bombs if their demands were not met. But deadlines came and went, and nothing happened. Negotiations have broken off for the night, and prison officials are studying Carrasco's latest demand. He wants transportation. He has not said what kind or when, so that he and his accomplices can try to get away. He would take four of the hostages with him. During the past week that this standoff has continued, Carrasco has made similar demands, then backed off. So tonight, it is just as impossible as ever to foresee when the hostages will be released safely and when the confrontation will end. David Henderson, CBS News, Huntsville, Texas. President Nixon's lawyer says there is an apparent gap more than five minutes in one of the 20 White House tape recordings surrendered Tuesday under court order. The new gap occurs midway through a meeting between Mr. Nixon and his former advisors, H.R. Haldeman and John Ehrlichman, on April 17, 1973. Presidential lawyer James St. Clair says the five minutes and 12 seconds of conversation were apparently never recorded because of a delay in replacing a full tape reel. John Ehrlichman, one of President Nixon's top domestic advisors, was sentenced to at least 20 months to five years in prison Wednesday for his part in the Ellsberg break-in. The Ehrlichman sentence was one of the toughest yet, and he still faces trial in the Watergate cover-up case. Ehrlichman remains free pending appeal and says he will ultimately be exonerated and vindicated. Jim Kilpatrick, CBS News.